All right, everybody, let's get started. <laughs> um, today, um, the paper for today is Amazon's Aurora paper, which is all about how to get a high performance, um, reliable database going as a piece of cloud infrastructure and itself built out of um, infrastructure that Amazon itself makes available. Um, so the reason why we're reading this paper is that, first of all, it's a very successful recent cloud service from Amazon. Um, a lot of their customers use it. Um, it shows sort of in its own way an example of a very big payoff from um, clever design. Table one, which sort of summarizes the performance, shows that um, relative to some other system, which is not very well explained, um, the paper claims to get a 35 times speed up in uh, transaction throughput, which is extremely impressive. This paper also kind of explores the limits of how well you can do for performance and fault tolerance using general purpose storage. Because one of the themes of the paper is they basically abandon general purpose storage. They switch from a design in which they were using their Amazon's own general purpose storage infrastructure, um, decided it was not good enough, and basically built totally application specific uh, storage. Furthermore, the paper has a lot of little tidbits about what turned out to be important in this um, uh, in the kind of cloud infrastructure world. Um, so before talking about Aurora, I want to um, spend a bit of time kind of going over the back history or what my uh, impression is about the uh, story that led up to the design of Aurora because it's you know the sort of nth way that Amazon has in mind that you ought to build, that their cust cloud customers ought to build databases on Amazon's infrastructure. Um, so in the beginning, Amazon had basically... Um, uh, their, their very first offering, cloud offering, to support people who wanted to build websites but using Amazon's hardware and, and Amazon's machine room. Their first offering was e something called EC2 for Elastic Cloud, apparently, too. Um, and the idea here is that Amazon had big machine rooms full of servers, and they ran virtual machine monitors on their servers, and they'd rent out virtual machines to their customers. Um, and their customers would then you know, rent a bunch of virtual machines and run web servers and databases and whatever ever all else um, they needed to run inside these EC2 instances. Um, so the picture of one um, physical server looks like this. Amazon uh, would control the virtual machine monitor uh, on this hardware server. And then there'd be a bunch of guests, a bunch of EC2 instances, each one rented out um, to a different cloud customer. And each of these would just run a standard operating system like Linux. Um, and then, you know, a web server or maybe a database server. Um, and these are relatively cheap, relatively easy to set up, and uh, is a very successful service. So um, uh, one little detail that's extremely important for us is that initially, um, the way you get storage, the way you got storage if you rented an EC2 instance was that every one of their servers had a disk attached, a physical disk attached, and each one of these um, instances that they rented to their customers would get a, a, you know, a slice of the disk. Um, so they just had locally attached storage, and you got a, a bit of locally attached storage, which itself just looked like a hard drive, an emulated hard drive to the um, virtual machine guests. Um, EC2 is like perfect for web servers, for stateless web servers. You know, your customers with their web browsers would connect to um, a bunch of rented EC2 instances that ran a web server. Um, and if you had all of a sudden more customers, you could just instantly rent more EC2 instances from Amazon and fire up web servers on them and sort of an easy way to scale up your ability to um, handle web load. Um, so it was good for web servers. But the other main thing that people ran in uh, EC2 instances was databases, because usually a website is constructed of a set of stateless web servers that anytime they need to get at uh, permanent data, um, go talk to a backend database. So um, what you would get is, is um, maybe a bunch of client browsers um, in the outside world, outside of Amazon's web infrastructure, and then um, a number of um, EC2 
web server instances, as many as you needed to run the sort of logic of the website. This, this is now inside Amazon. Um, and then also some, also pr typically one uh, EC2 instance running a database. Um, your web servers would talk to your database instance and ask it to read and write records in the database. Unfortunately, EC2 wasn't perfect, wasn't nearly as uh, well suited to running a database as it was to running web servers. And the most immediate reason is that um, the storage, or the sort of main easy way to get storage uh, for your EC2 database instance was on the locally attached um, disk attached to whatever piece of hardware your database instance was currently running on. And if that hardware crashed, then you also lost access to whatever what is on its hard drive. Um, so if, uh, if the hardware that was actually implementing a uh, web server crashed, no problem at all, because it really keeps no state itself. You just fire up a new web server on a new EC2 instance. If the EC2 instance is the hardware running it um, crashes or become unavailable, you have a serious problem if the data is stored um, on the locally attached disk. Um, so initially, at least, there wasn't sort of a lot of help for doing this. One thing that um, did work out well is that Amazon did provide this sort of large, this um, scheme for storing large chunks of data called S3, and you could take snapshots. You could take period periodic snapshots of your database state and store it in S3 um, and use that for sort of backup disaster recovery. Um, but you know, that style of periodic snapshots means you're gonna lose updates that happen between the periodic backups. All right, so um, the next thing that came along that's, that's relevant to the sort of Aurora database story is that in order to provide their customers with um, disks for their EC2 instances that didn't go away if there was a failure, that is more sort of fault tolerant long-term storage that was guaranteed to be there, uh, Amazon introduced this service called EBS. And this stands for Elastic Block Store. So what EBS is is a service that looks to an EC2 instances, it looks to the, one of these instances, one of these guest virtual machines, just as if it were a, a hard drive in the ordinary way. You could format it as a hard drive, put a file system like ext3 or whatever Linux file system you like on this, on this thing that looks to the guest just like a hard drive. But the way it's actually implemented is as a replicated pair of storage servers. So, um, so this is the local, this is what a local storage looked like. Um, if when EBS came out, then you could, you could rent an EBS volume, which is this thing that looks just like an ordinary hard drive, but it's actually implemented as a pair. Um, so these are EBS servers, a pair of EBS servers, um, each with an attached hard drive. So if your software here, maybe you're running a database now and your database is, mounts one of these EBS volumes as its storage, when the database server does a write, what that actually means is that the write is sent out over the network and using chain replication, which we talked about last week, um, your write is you know, first written to the, the EBS server one, and the first EBS server that's backing your volume, and then the second one, and, and finally you get the reply. Um, and similarly, when you do a read, um, you know, I guess in chain replication, you read the last of the chain. So now, um, databases running on EC2 instances had available a storage system that actually would survive the crash of, um, or the you know, death of the hardware that they were running on. If this physical server died, um, you could just get another EC2 instance, fire up your database, and have it attached to the same old EBS volume that the sort of previous version of your database was attached to, and it would see all the old data just as it had been left off by the previous database, um, uh, just like you moved a hard drive from one machine to another. So EBS was like really um, a good deal for people who needed to keep permanent state, like uh, people running databases. Um, um, one thing to, uh, that is sort of important for us about EBS is that it's really, it's not a system for sharing. At any one time, um, only one EC2 instance, only one uh, virtual machine can mount a given EBS volume. So the EBS volumes are implemented on a huge fleet of you know, hundreds or whatever storage servers with disks at Amazon, um, and they're all, you know, everybody's 
EBS volumes are stored on this big pool of servers, but um, each one of them, each EBS volume can only be used by only one uh, EC2 instance, only one customer. All right, still, um, EBS was a big step up, but uh, it had, still had some problems. Um, so there's still some things that are not quite as perfect as it could be. Um, one is that if you run a database on EBS, it ends up sending large volumes of data across the network. Um, and th this is, uh, we're, we're now starting to sort of sneak up on figure two in the, um, in the paper where they start complaining about how many, just how many writes it takes if you run a database on top of a network storage system. Um, so there's the database on EBS ended up generating a lot of network traffic. Um, and one of the kind of things in the paper that the paper implies is that they are as much network limited as they are CPU or storage limited. That is, they pay a huge amount of attention to reducing the, the Aurora paper spends a huge amount of attention to reducing the network load that the database generates and seems to be worrying less about how much CPU time or disk space is being consumed. Um, so that's a um, sort of a hint at, a, at what they think is important. The other problem with EBS is not very fault tolerant. It turns out that for performance reasons, um, they, Amazon would always put both of the EBS, both of the replicas of your EBS volume in the same data center. Um, and so if a single server crashed, if you know, one of the two EBS servers that you're using crashed, it's okay because you switched to the other one. But there's just no story at all for what happens if an entire data center went down. Um, and um, and apparently a lot of customers um, really wanted a story that would allow their data to survive an outage of an entire data center. Um, maybe it lost its network connection, or there was a fire in the building, or a power failure to the whole building or something. People really wanted to have at least the option, if they're willing to pay more, of having their data stored in a way they, they could still get at it, um, even if one data center goes down. Um, and the way that uh, Amazon would describe this um, there, uh, is that both an instance and its EBS two EBS replicas are in the same avail availability zone. Um, and in Amazon jargon, an availability zone is a particular data center. And the way they structure their data centers is that there's um, usually multiple independent data centers in more or less the same city or relatively close to each other. Um, and all the, the multiple availability zones, maybe two or three, that are nearby each other are all connected uh, by redundant high-speed networks. So there's always pairs or triples of nearby availability centers. And we'll see why that's important in a little bit. But at least for EBS, um, in order to keep the sort of costs of using chain replication down, um, they required the two uh, replicas to be in the same availability zone. All right. Um, before I dive into more into how um, Aurora actually works, it, it turns out that the details of the design, um, in order to understand them, we first have to know a fair amount about uh, the sort of design of typical databases. Because what they've taken is sort of the um, main machinery of a database, MySQL, as it happens, and split it up in an interesting way. So we need to know sort of what it, what it is a database does so we can understand uh, how they split it up. So this is really a kind of um, database tutorial um, really focusing on what it takes to implement uh, transactions, crash recoverable transactions. So what I really care about is um, transactions and crash recovery. And there's a lot else going on in databases, but this is really the part that matters for this paper. Um, so uh, first, what's a transaction? You know, transaction is just a way of wrapping multiple operations on maybe different pieces of data and declaring that that, the, that entire sequence of operations should appear atomic to anyone else who's reading or writing the data. So you might see, uh, trans supposing we're running a bank and we want to do transfers between different accounts, um, maybe we would say, well, we would see code or you know, see a transaction that looks like this. You've got to declare the beginning of the sequence of instructions 
that you want to be atomic in the transaction. Maybe we're going to transfer money from account um, Y to account X. So we might see where, you know, we'll just pretend X is a bank balance stored in the database. We might see the transaction looks like, oh, going to add $10 to X's account and um, deduct the same $10 from Y account, and uh, that's the end of the transaction. I want the database to just do them both without allowing anybody else to sneak in and see the state between these two statements. And also, um, with respect to crashes, if there's a crash at this point somewhere in here, we want to make sure that after the crash and recovery that either the entire transaction's worth of modifications are visible or none of them are. Um, so that's the effect we want from transactions. There's additionally, uh, people expect, database users expect that the database will tell them tell the client that submitted the tra transaction whether the transaction really finished and committed or not. And if a transaction is committed, we expect, uh, clients expect that the transaction will be permanent, will be durable, still there, even if the database should crash and reboot. Um, one thing that's a bit important is that the usual way these are implemented is that the transaction locks each piece of data before it uses it. So you can view the, um, there being locks on um, X and Y for the duration of the transaction, and these are only released after the transaction finally commits that is known to be um, permanent. And this is important if you, for some of the things that you have to, if you, some of the details in the paper really only make sense if you realize that the database is actually locking out other access to the data during the life of a transaction. Um, so how this actually implemented, um, it turns out the database um, consists of, uh, at least for the simple database model, where the databases are typically written to run on a single server with you know, some storage directly attached. And a game that the Aurora paper is playing is sort of moving that software um, only modestly revised in order to run on a much more complex network system. But you know, the starting point is uh, we just assume we have a database with a, attached to a disk. Um, the on-disk structure that stores these Records is some kind of indexing structure, like a B tree, maybe. So um, there's a sort of pages, what the paper calls data pages, that hold the you know real data of the um, of the database. You know, maybe this is X's balances and this is Y's balance. These data pages typically hold lots and lots of records, um, whereas X and Y are typically just a couple bytes on some page in the database. So on the disk, there's the uh, actual data plus on the disk, there's also um, a write-ahead log, or WAL. And the write-ahead log is sort of a critical part of why the system is um, going to be fault tolerant. Inside the database server, there's the database software. The database typically has a cache of pages that it's you know, read from the disk that it's recently used. When you execute a transaction, what that actually, like, execute these statements, what that really means is, you know, what x equals x plus 10 turns into, the runtime is that the database reads the current page holding x from the disk um, and adds 10 to it, but so far until the transaction commits, it only makes the modifications in the local cache, not on the disk. Because we don't want to expose, we don't want to write on the disk yet and part, possibly expose a partial transaction. Um, so, um, while when the database, bef before, because the database wants to sort of pre-declare the complete transaction so it's available uh, to the software after a crash and during recovery, before the database is allowed to modify the real data pages on disk, it's first required to add log entries that describe the, um, the transaction. So it has to, in order, before it can commit the transaction, it needs to put a complete set of log ahead entries in the write-ahead log on disk I'm describing all the database's modifications. So let's suppose here that um, X and Y start out as, say, 500, and Y starts out as 750, right? and we want to execute this transaction. Before committing and before writing the pages, the database is going to add at least typically three log records. One that's, that says, well, as part of this transaction, I'm modifying X, and its old value is 500. Um, Make more room here. This is the on disk log. So each log entry might say, here's the value I'm modifying. 
here's the old value, and we're adding, and here's the new value, say 510. So that's one log record. Um, another for y, maybe the old value is 750. We're subtracting 10, so the new value is 740. Um, and then when the database, if it actually manages to get to the end of the transaction before crashing, it's gonna write a commit record um, saying, and typically these are all tagged with some sort of, with a transaction ID, so that the recovery software eventually will know, oh, this commit record refers to these log records. Yes? Why do you need to store the old value as opposed to so x becomes 510, y becomes 740? Um, in a simple database, it would be enough to just store the new values and say, well, if there's a crash, we're gonna just reapply all the new values. The reason uh, most serious databases uh, store the old value as well as the new value is to give them freedom to, um, even for a long running traction, for a long running transaction, even before the transaction is finished, it, it gives the database the freedom to write the updated page to disk with the new value, 740, let's say, from, the, uh, from an uncompleted transaction, as long as it's written the log record to disk. And then if there's a crash before the commit, the recovery software will say, aha, well this transaction never finished, therefore we have to undo all of its changes. And these values, these old values, are the values you need in order to undo a transaction that's been partially written to the data pages. So the Aurora um, indeed uh, uses undo, redo logging to be able to undo partially applied transactions. Okay, so if the database manages to get as far as getting the transactions log records on the disk and a commit record, marking it as finished, then it is entitled to reply to the client. We said the transaction is committed, the database can reply to the client, and the client be, can be assured that uh, its transaction will be sort of visible forever. Um, and now one of two things happens. If the database server doesn't crash, then eventually, so it, it's modified in its cache, these, uh, these X and Y records to be 510 and 740, eventually the database will write its cached updated blocks to their real places on the disk, overwriting uh, you know, these B-tree nodes or something, and then the database can reuse this part of the log. Um, so databases tend to be lazy about that because they like to accumulate, uh, you know, maybe there'll be many updates to these pages in the cache. It's nice to accumulate a lot of updates before being forced to write the disk. Um, if the database server crashes before writing, the di writing these pages to the disk, so that they still have their old values, then, um, it's guaranteed that the recovery software, when you restart the database, will scan the log, see these records for the transaction, see that that transaction was committed, um, and apply the new values uh, to, the, um, to the stored data. And that's called a redo. It basically redoes all the writes in the transaction. So that's how transactional databases work in a nutshell. Um, and so this is a sort of very extremely abbreviated version of um, how, for example, the MySQL database works that um, and Aurora is based on this open source software thing called, database called MySQL, which does crash recovery and transaction and crash recovery in much this way. Okay, so the next step um, in Amazon's uh, development of better and better database infrastructure for its cloud customers um, is something called uh, RDS. And I'm only talking about RDS because it turns out that even though the paper doesn't quite mention it, figure two in the paper is basically a description of RDS. And so what's going on um, in RDS is that it was a first attempt to get a database that was replicated in multiple availability zones so that if an entire data center went down, um, you could get back your database contents without missing any writes. So the deal with RDS is that uh, there's one, you have one EC2 instance that's the database server. So you just have one, you're just one, running one database. It stores uh, its data pages and log, which is basically what this, oh, instead of on the local disk, it stores them in EBS. So whenever the database does a log write or page write or whatever, um, those writes actually go to these two uh, EBS volumes, EBS replicas. In addition, so, and so this is in one availability zone, 
In addition, for every write that the database software does, Amazon would transparently, without the database even realizing necessarily this was happened, um, also send those writes to a special setup in a second availability zone, in a second machine room, to um, just going from figure two to apparently a separate computer or EC2 instance or something whose job was just to mirror writes that the main database did. So th this other sort of mirroring server would then just copy these writes to a second pair of EBS servers. And so with this setup, with this RDS setup, in, that's what in figure two, every time the database appends to the log or writes to one of its pages, it has to, the um, data has to be sent to these two replicas, has to be sent a, a, a network connection across the other availability zone on the other side of town, sent to this mirroring server, which would then send it to its two separate EBS replicas, um, and then finally this reply would come back, and then only then would the write be finished. Um, would the database see, aha, my write's finished, I can um, you know, count this log record as really being appended to the log or whatever. So this RDS arrangement um, gets you much better fault tolerance because now you have a complete up-to-date copy of the database, like seeing the, all the very latest writes in a separate availability zone. Even if you know, fire burns down this entire data center, boom, you can, recon, you can run the database in a new instance in the second availability zone and lose no data at all. Um, yes? Um, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, that is just not what they do. And m my guess is that it would be that for most EBS customers, it would be too painfully slow to forward every write across to a separate data center. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on, but the, I think the main answer is they don't do that. Um, and this is sort of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a workaround for the way EBS works to kind of trick EBS into actually producing and sort of using the existing EBS infrastructure unchanged. Um, as table one shows, this turns out to be um, extremely expensive. Um, or anyway, it's as expensive as you might think. You know, we're writing fairly large volumes of data because e you know, even this uh, transaction, which seems like it, ah, it just modifies two integers, like maybe eight bytes or I don't know what, 16, who knows. Only a few bytes of data are being modified here. What that translates to as far as the database reading and writing the disk is, I, actually these log records are the, also quite small. So this, these two log records might themselves only be dozens of bytes long, so that's nice. But the reads and writes of the actual data pages are likely to be much, much larger than just a couple of dozen bytes. Because each of these pages is gonna be you know, eight kilobytes or 16 kilobytes or some relatively large number of the file system or disk block size. Um, and uh, it means that just to read and write these two numbers when it comes time to update the data pages is a lot of data being pushed around onto the disk. On a locally attached disk, you know, it's reasonably fast. Um, but I guess what they found is when they start sending those big eight kilobyte writes across the network um, that that used up too much network capacity uh, to be supported. And so um, this arrangement, this figure two arrangement, um, evidently was too slow. Yes? Do they have to set the pages between any of those windows or just to the EBS server in the same zone? So, so in, this, in this figure two setup, the uh, you know, unknown to the database server, every time it called write, wrote its EBS disk, a copy of every write went over across availability zones and had to be written to the, was written to the, both of these EBS servers and then acknowledged and only then did the write appear to complete to the database. So it really had to wait for all, the, all four copies to be updated and for the data to be sent on the link across to the other availability zone. Um, and, um, you know, as far as uh, table one is concerned, that first um, performance table, the reason why the, um, the reason why the slow, the uh, mirrored MySQL line is much, much slower than the Aurora line is basically that it sends huge amounts of data um, over these relatively slow network links. 
And that was the problem. That was the performance problem that they're really trying to fix. So this is good for fault tolerance, because now we have a second copy in another availability zone. But it was um, bad news for performance. All right, the way Aurora, um, you know, the next step after this is Aurora. And the setup there, the high level view is we still have a database server, although now it's running custom software that Amazon supplies. So I can rent an Aurora server from Amazon, but it's not, I'm not running my software on it. I'm renting a server running Amazon's Aurora database software on it. So I rent an Aurora database server from them. Um, and it's, it's just one instance that sits in some, some availability zone. And um, there's two interesting things about the way it's set up. First of all is that uh, the data, you know, its replacement basically for EBS involves um, six replicas now, two in each of three availability zones for, uh, for super fault tolerance. And so every time the database, and that's complicated and we'll talk, but basically when the database writes or reads, when the database writes, um, it's, uh, we're not sure exactly how it's managed, but it more or less um, needs to send a write one way or another, writes have to get sent to all six of these replicas. Um, the key to making, and so this looks like more replicas. Gosh, you know, why isn't it slower? Why isn't it slower than this previous scheme, which only had four replicas? And the answer to that is that what's being, the only thing being written over the network is the log records. So that's really the key to success, is that the data that goes over these links and is sent to the replicas is just the log records or log entries. And as you can see, you know, a log entry here, you know, at least in this simple example, you know, it's not quite this small, but it's really not vastly more than a couple of dozen bytes needed to store the old value and the new value for the piece of data we're, we're writing. So the log entries tend to be quite small. Um, whereas when the database, you know, when we had a database that thought it was writing a local disk and it was updating its data pages, these tended to be enormous. Like, doesn't really say in the paper, I don't think, but eight kilobytes or, or, or more. So this setup here was sending, for each transaction, was sending multiple eight kilobyte pages across to the replicas, whereas this setup is just sending these small log entries to more replicas, but the log entries are so very much smaller than the 8K pages that it's a net performance win. Um, okay, so that's one, uh, this is like, uh, one of their big insights is just in the log entries. Of course, a fallout from this is that their storage system is now not very general purpose. This is a storage system that understands what to do with MySQL log entries. Right? It's not just, you know, EBS was a very general purpose, just emulated a disk, you read and write blocks, it doesn't understand anything about anything except for blocks. This is a storage system that really understands that it's sitting underneath a database. Um, so that's one thing they've done is ditched general purpose storage and switched to um, a very application specific storage system. Um, the other big thing, um, which I'll also go into in more detail, is that they don't require that the writes um, be acknowledged by all six replicas in order for the database server to continue. Um, instead, the database server can continue as long as a quorum and which turns out to be four, as long as any four of these servers responds. So if one of these availability zones is um, offline, or maybe the network connection to it is slow, or maybe even just these servers just happen to be slow doing something else at the moment we're trying to write, um, the database server can basically ignore the two slowest or the two most dead of the servers when it's doing writes. It only requires acknowledgments from any four out of six, and then it can continue. And so this quorum scheme is the other big um, uh, trick they use to help them um, have more replicas in more availability zones and yet not pay a huge performance penalty because they never have to wait for all of them, just the four fastest of the six replicas. Um, and so the rest of the lecture is gonna be explaining first quorums and then log entries and then this idea of just sending log entries basically. 
Um, table one summarizes the result. If you look at table one, uh, by switching from this architecture in which they send the big data pages to four places to this uh, Aurora scheme of sending just the log entries to six replicas, they get an amazing 35 times performance increase over some other system, you know, this system over here, um, by playing these two tricks. And the paper's not very good about explaining how much of the performance is due to quorums and how much is due to just sending log entries, but anyway, you slice it, uh, 35 times improvement in performance is um, very respectable and, of course, extremely valuable to their customers and to them. I mean, it's like transformative, um, I am sure, for many of Amazon's customers. All right. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about in, um, in detail is their quorum arrangement, what they actually mean by quorums. Um, so first of all, the quorums is all about uh, the arrangement of fault tolerant, this fault tolerant storage. Um, so it's worth thinking a little bit about what their fault tolerance goals were. So uh, this is like fault tolerance goals. They wanted to be able to do writes, even if one reads and writes, even if one availability zone was completely dead. So um, you're going to write, um, you know, even with you know one dead AZ. They wanted to be able to read, even if there was one dead availability zone plus one other dead server. Um, and the reason for this is that an availability zone might be offline for quite a while because maybe it's, you know, kind of was uh, suffered from a flood or something. And while it's down for a couple days or a week or something while people repair the damage from the flood, we're now reliant on just, you know, the servers and the other two availability zones. If one of them should go down, we still, we don't want it to be a disaster. So um, they wanted to be able to write with one, even with one dead availability zone. They, furthermore, they wanted to be able to read um, with one dead availability zone plus one other dead server. So they wanted to be able to still read, you know, and, and get the correct data, even if there was one dead availability zone plus one other server in the live availability zones were dead. So, um, you know, like, we have to sort of take, take it for granted that they know what they're, they know their own business and that this is really, uh, you know, kind of the sweet spot for how fault tolerant you want to be. Um, and in addition, as I already mentioned, they want to be able to, toler to sort of ride out temporarily slow replicas. I, I think from uh, a lot of sources, it's clear that the, if you read and write EBS, for example, you don't get consistently high performance all the time. Sometimes there's little glitches because maybe some part of the network is overloaded or something is doing a software upgrade or whatever, um, and it's temporarily slow. So they want to uh, be able to just keep going despite transient, uh, um, transiently slow or maybe briefly unavailable um, storage servers. And a final requirement is that if something, if a storage server should fail, it's a bit of a race against time before the next storage server fails. It's sort of always the case. And it's not, the um, statistics are not as favorable as you might hope because typically you buy, basically because server failure is often not independent, right? The fact that one server is down often means that there's a much increased probability that another one of your servers will soon go down because it's identical hardware, maybe bought from the same company, came off the same production line one after another. And so a flaw in one of them is extremely likely to be reflected in a flaw in another one. So people are always nervous, ah, if there's one failure, boy, there could be a second failure very soon. Um, and in a system like this, um, well, it turns out in these quorum systems, you know, you can only recover, it's a little bit like Raft, you can recover as long as um, not too many of the replicas fail. So they really needed to have fast re-replication. That is, if one server seems permanently dead, we'd like to be able to generate a new replica as fast as possible from the remaining replicas. So we have fast re-replication. So these are the main fault tolerance goals the paper lays out. <clears throat> 
And by the way, th th this discussion is only about the storage servers and you know, what their failure characteristics, how to deal with failures, how to recover. And it's a completely separate topic what to do if the database server fails. Um, and uh, uh, Aurora has a totally different um, uh, set of machinery for um, noticing a database server has failed, creating a new instance, running a, a new database server on a new instance, um, which is and it's, it's not what I'm talking about right now. We'll talk about it a little bit later on. Right now, it's just we want to build a storage system that's a lot that's it, this, where the storage system is fault tolerant. Um, okay, so they use this idea called quorums, um, and. Uh, um, for, for a little while now, I'm going to describe the sort of classic quorum idea, which is, um, dates back to the late 70s. Um, so this is quorum, replica quorum replication. So I'm going to describe to you the sort of abstract quorum idea. They use a, a variant of what I'm going to explain. Um, and the idea behind quorum, quorum systems, is to be able to build storage systems that uh, provide fault-tolerant storage using replications um, and guarantee that even if some of the replicas fail, your, uh, that reads will still see the most recent writes. Um, and typically, quorum systems are sort of simple read-write systems, put-get systems, um, and they don't typically directly support more complex operations. Just you can read, uh, you can have objects, you can read an object, or you can overwrite an entire object. And so the idea is you have n replicas. Um, If you want to write, or you have to get, you have to, in order to write, you have to make sure your write is acknowledged by W, where W is less than N of the replicas. So um, W writes, you have to send each write to at least W of the replicas. And if you want to do a read, um, you have to get inf read information from at least R um, of the replicas. And so um, a typical setup, so um, well, first of all, uh, the key thing here is that W and R have to be set relative to N so that any quorum of W servers that you manage to send a write to must necessarily overlap with any quorum of R servers that any future reader might read from. And so what that means um, is that uh, R plus W uh, has to be greater than N so that any W servers must overlap in at least one server with any R servers. Um, and so you might have three, we can imagine there's three servers, S1, S2, S3. Each of them holds, let's say we just have one object that we're updating. We send out a write, maybe we want to set the value of our object to 23. Well, in order to do a write, we need to get our new value onto at least W of the, um, of the replicas. Let's say for this system that um, R and W are both equal to 2 and N is equal to 3. That's this setup. To do a write, we need to get our new value onto a quorum, onto at least 2 of the server. So maybe we get our write onto these two. So they both now know that the value of the of our data object is 23. If somebody comes along and reads, a read also requires that the reader check with at least a read quorum of the servers. So that's also two in this setup. So um, you know that quorum could include a server that didn't see the write, but it has to include at least one other in order to get two. So um, that means the, any future read must, for example, consult both this server that didn't see the write plus at least one that did. That is. A read quorum and a write quorum must overlap in at least one server, and so any read uh, must consult a server that saw any previous write. Now, um, what's cool about this, well, actually, there's still one critical missing piece here. The, a reader is going to get back R results, possibly R different results. Um, because, and the question is, how does a reader know which of the R results it got back from the R servers in its quorum, which one to actually use as the correct value? Um, 
Something that doesn't work is voting, like just voting by popularity of the different values it gets back it turns out not to work because we're only guaranteed that a reader overlaps with a writer in at most one server. So that could mean that the correct value is only represented by one of the servers that the uh, reader consulted. Um, and you know, in a system with, say, six replicas, you, know, you might have read quorum might be four. You might get back uh, four answers, and only one of them is the answer that uh, is the correct answer in, from the server in which you overlap with the previous write. So you can't use voting. And instead, these quorum systems need version numbers. So every write, um, every time you do a write, you need to accompany your new value with you know, an increasing version number. Um, and then the reader gets back a bunch of different values from the read quorum, and it can just use the one with the highest version number. Um, so that means that this 21 here, you know, maybe S2 had an old value of uh, 20. Each of these needs to be tagged with a version number, so maybe this is version number three. This is also version number three because it came from the same original write, and we're imagining that this server that didn't see the write is going to have version number two. Then the reader gets back these two values, these two version numbers, picks the version with the highest, the value with the highest version number. Um, and in Aurora, this was essentially about, uh, well, never mind about Aurora for a moment. Um, OK. Um, furthermore, if you can't talk to, a, if you can't actually contact a quorum for a reader or write, you really just have to keep trying. Um, those are the rules. So you've got to keep trying until um, uh, the servers are brought back up or connected again. Um, so the reason why this is preferable to something like chain replication is that um, it can easily ride out uh, temporary uh, dead or disconnected or slow servers. So in fact, the way it would work is that if you want to read or write, um, if you want to write, you would send your newly written value, you would send the newly written value plus its version number to all of the servers, to all n of the servers, but only wait for w of them to respond. And similarly, if you want to read, you would, in a quorum system, you would send the read to all the servers and only wait for a quorum for r of the servers to respond. Um, and that, and because you only have to wait for r out of n of them, um, that means that you can continue after the fastest r have responded or the fastest w, and you don't have to wait for a slow server or a server that's dead. And there's not any, you know, the, the machinery for ignoring slow or dead servers is completely implicit. There's nothing here about, oh, we have to sort of make decisions about which servers are up or down or elect leaders or anything. It just um, kind of automatically proceeds as long as a quorum is available. So we get very smooth handling of dead or slow servers. Um, in addition, uh, there's not much leeway for it here. Well, actually, you, even in this simple case, you can adjust the R and W to make either reads, to favor either reads or writes. So here we could actually say that, well, the write quorum is three. Every write has to go to all three servers. And in that case, the read quorum can be one. Um, so you could, if you wanted to favor reads with this setup, um, you get a read equals one, write equals three. And the reads are much faster. They only have to wait for one server. But then in return, the writes are slow. If you wanted to favor writes, you could say that, oh, any reader has to read from all of them. But a writer only has to write one. Um, so that means only one server might have the latest value, but the um, readers have to consult all three. Um, but they're guaranteed that their three will overlap with this. Of course, these particular values makes writes not fault tolerant, and here reads not fault tolerant because all the servers have to be up. So you probably wouldn't want to do this in real life. You might have, you would have, as an Aurora does, a larger number of servers and um, sort of intermediate numbers of read and write quorums. Um, Aurora, in order to achieve its goals here of um, being able to write with one dead availability zone and read with one dead availability zone plus one other server, it uses a quorum system with n equals 6, w equals uh, 4, and r equals 3. So the w equals 4 means that it can do a write um, with one dead availability zone. If this availability zone can't be contacted, well, these other four servers 
are enough to complete a write. Um, the read quorum of three, so four plus three equals seven, so they definitely guaranteed overlap. A read quorum of three means that even if one availability is, zone is dead plus one more server, the three remaining servers are enough to serve a read. Now, in this case where three servers are now down, the system can do reads and is, you know, can reconstruct the, can find the current state of the database, but it can't do writes without further work. So if they were in a situation where there was um, three dead servers, they have enough of a quorum to be able to read the data and reconstruct more, cop more replicas, um, but until they've created more replicas to basically replace these dead ones, um, they can't service writes. Um, and also the quorum system, as I explained before, allows them to uh, ride out these transient uh, slow replicas. All right. Um, as it happens, um, as I explained before, what the writes in Aurora aren't really overwriting objects as in a sort of classic quorum system. What Aurora, in fact, its writes never overwrite anything. Um, its writes just append log entries to the current log. So the way it's using quorums is basically to say, well, when the database sends out a new log record because it's executing some transaction, it needs to make sure that that log record is present on at least four of, the store, of its storage servers before it's allowed to proceed with the transaction or commit it. So that's really the meaning of, its, of Aurora's write quorums is that each new log record has to be appended to the storage in at least four of the replicas before the write can be considered to, uh, to have completed. Um, and when, a, when Aurora gets to the end of a transaction, before it can reply to the client and tell the client, tell the client aha, you know, your transaction is committed and finished and durable, um, uh, Aurora has to wait for acknowledgments from a write quorum for each of the log records that made up that transaction. And, and in fact, because, um, you know, because uh, um, if there were a crash and a recovery, you're not allowed to uh, recover one transaction if preceding transactions don't, aren't also recovered. In practice, Aurora has, before Aurora can acknowledge a transaction, it has to wait for um, a, a write quorum of storage servers to respond for all previously committed transaction and the transaction of interest, and then it can respond to the client. Um, okay, so these, uh, these storage servers are getting incoming log records. That's what writes look like to them. And so what do they actually do? You know, they're not getting new data pages from the database server, they're just getting log records that des describe changes to the data pages. So internally, one of these, um, one of these storage servers, it has, internally, it has copies of all the data, of all the, um, data pages at some point in the data pages, data pages evolution. So it has maybe in its cache or on its disk um, uh, a whole bunch of these pages, you know, page one, page two, so forth. When a new write comes in, the storage server, when, sorry, when a new log record, when a new write arrives carrying with it just a log record, what has to happen someday, but not right away, is that the changes in that log record, the new value here, has to be applied to the relevant page. But we don't have, the source server doesn't have to do that until someone asks, to, until the database server or the recovery software asks to see that page. So immediately what happens to a new log record is that the log records are just appended to lists of log records that affect each page. So for every page that the storage server stores, um, if it's been recently modified by a log record, by a transaction, what the storage server will actually store is an old version of the page plus the string of the sequence of log records that have come in um, from, from the database server since that page was last brought up to date. So if nothing else happens, the storage server just stores these old pages plus lists of log records. If the database server later 
you know, evicts the page from its cache and then needs to read the page again for a future transaction, it'll send a read request out um, to one of the storage servers and say, look, you know, I need a copy. I need an updated copy of page one. And at that point, the storage server will apply um, these log records to the page, you know, do, do these writes of new data that are implied and that are uh, described in the log records, and then send that updated page back to the database server. And presumably, um, maybe then like erase its list and just store the newly updated page. Although, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> um, all right, so the storage servers just um, store these strings of log records plus old log page versions. Um, now, the database server, as I mentioned, sometimes needs to read pages. So, by the way, one thing to observe is that the database server is writing log records, but it's reading data pages. So it's also different from a quorum system in the sense that the sort of things that are being read and written are quite different. In addition, it turns out that in ordinary operation, the database server um, knows, doesn't have to send quorum reads because the database server tracks for each one of the storage servers how far, how much of the prefix of the log that storage server has actually received. So the database server is keeping track of these six numbers. So, so first of all, log entries are numbered, just one, two, three, four, five. The database server sends out new log entries to all the um, storage servers. The storage servers have received them response saying, oh yeah, I got log entries 79, and furthermore, you know, I have every log entry before 79 also. And the database server keeps track of these numbers, how far each server has gotten, um, or what the highest sort of contiguous log entry number is that each of the servers has gotten. So that way, when the database server needs to do a read, it just picks a storage server that's up to date and sends the read request for the page it wants just to that storage server. So the, um, the database server does have to do quorum writes, but it basically doesn't ordinarily have to do quorum reads. It knows which of these storage servers are up to date and just reads from one of them. So the reads are much cheaper than they would be in a, uh, it just reads one copy of the page and doesn't have to go through the expense of a quorum read. Um, now, it does sometimes use quorum reads. It turns out that during crash recovery, you know, if the cra during crash recovery of the database server, and so this is different from sort of crash recovery of the storage servers, if the database server itself should crash, and maybe because the you know, it's running in an EC2 instance on some piece of hardware, some real piece of hardware, maybe that piece of hardware suffers a failure, um, the database server crashes. There's some monitoring infrastructure at Amazon that says, oh, wait a minute, you know, the database, the Aurora database server we're running for a customer or whatever just crashed, um, and uh, Amazon will automatically fire up a new EC2 instance, start up the database software in that in EC2 instance, and sort of tell it, look, your data is sitting on this particular volume, this set of storage systems, please clean up any partially executed transactions that are evident in the logs stored in these storage servers and continue. Um, so we have to, um, and uh, that's the point at which Aurora uses quorum logic for reads because this database server, um, when the, old, when the previous database server crashed, it was almost certainly partway through executing some set of transactions. So the state of play at the time of the crash was, well, it's completed some transactions and committed them, and their log entries are on a quorum, plus it's in the middle of executing some other set of transactions, which also may have log entries on, on a quorum, but because the database server crashed midway through those transactions, they can never be completed. Um, and for those transactions that haven't completed, in addition, there may be, you know, we may have a situation in which, uh, you know, maybe log entry, this server has log entry 101, and this server has log entry 102, and there's 104 somewhere, but um, no, you know, for a, as yet uncommitted transaction before the crash, maybe no server um, got a copy of log entry 103. So after a crash, and, when the new database servers are covering, 
it does quorum reads to basically find the point in the log, the highest log number for which every preceding log entry exists somewhere in the storage service. So basically it finds the first missing, the number of the first missing log entry, which is 103, um, and says, well, as we're missing a log entry, we can't do anything with the log after this point because we're like missing an update. Um, so the database server does these quorum reads. It finds, aha, 103 is the first um, entry that's, that's, I can't, you know, I look at my quorum of servers I can reach and 103 is not there. And the database server will send out a message to all the servers saying, look, please just discard every log entry from 103 onwards. And those must necessarily not um, include log entries from committed transactions because we know a transaction can't commit until all of its entries are on a right quorum. Um, so we would be guaranteed to see them. So we're only discarding log entries from uncommitted transactions. Um, of course, um, so we're sort of cutting off the log here at log entry 102. Um, th these log entries that we're preserving now may actually include log entries from uncommitted transactions, from transactions that were interrupted by the crash. And the database server actually has to detect those, which it can by seeing, oh, you know, a certain transaction, there, there, it has update entries in the log but no commit record, the database server will find the full set of those uncompleted transactions and basically issue undo operations, and sort of new log entries that undo um, all of the changes that, that, uh, that those uncommitted transactions made. And you know, that's the point at which uh, Aurora needs this, these old values in the log entries so that a um, server that's doing recovery after a crash can, can sort of back out of partially completed transactions. All right, one, um, another thing I'd like to talk about is uh, how Aurora deals with big databases. Um, so, so far I've explained um, the storage setup as if oh, the, a database just has these six uh, replicas of its storage, and if that were, there were, was all there was to it, basically a database couldn't be, you know, each of these is just a computer with a disk or two or something attached to it. Um, if this were the way the, the full situation, then we couldn't have a database that was bigger than the amount of storage that you could put on a single machine. Because the fact that we have six machines doesn't give us six times as much usable storage because each one of them is storing a replica of the same old data again and again. Um, and you know, so on a, if we want to use solid state drives or something, we can put you know, terabytes of storage on a single machine, but we can't put um, you know, hundreds of terabytes on a single machine. Uh, so in order to support customers who need like you know, more than 10 terabytes, who need to have vast databases, um, Amazon is happy, Amazon will split up the database's data onto multiple ch uh, sets of six replicas. So, um, and, and the kind of unit of uh, sharding, the unit of splitting up the data I think is 10 gigabytes. So um, a database that needs 20 gigabytes of data will use two protection groups, these, these PG things too. Its data you know, will sit on, uh, half of it will sit on the six servers of protection group one, um, and then there'll be another six servers, you know, possibly a different set of six storage servers, because Amazon's running in like a huge fleet of these storage servers that are jointly used by all of its Aurora customers. Um, the second 10 gigabytes of the database's 20 gigabytes of data will be um, replicated on another set of, um, you know, typically different, you know, there could be overlap between these, but typically just a different set of six servers. So now we get 20 gigabits of data and, and we have more of these as, um, as the database grows bigger. One interesting piece of fallout from this is that while it's clear um, that you can take the uh, data pages and split them up over multiple independent protection groups, maybe you know, odd numbered data pages from your B tree go on PG1 and even number pages go on PG2. It's clear you can shard, split up the data pages. It's not immediately obvious what to do with the log, right? How do you split up the log if you have two of these two protection groups or more than one protection group? Um, and the answer that Amazon does is that the, 
is that Aurora uses is that the database server, when it's sending out a log record, it looks at the data that the log record modifies and figures out um, which protection groups store that data. And it sends each log record just to the protection groups that store data that's mentioned, that's modified in the log entry. Um, and so that means that um, each of these protection groups stores some fraction of the data pages plus all the log records that apply to those data pages. So each of these protection groups stores a subset of the log that's relevant to its pages. Um, so a final, uh, maybe I erase the, the fault tolerance requirements, but a final requirement is that if a, uh, if a, one of these storage servers crashes, we want to be able to replace it as soon as possible, right? Because, um, you know, if we wait too long, then we risk maybe three of them or four of them crashing. And if four of them crash, then um, we actually can't recover because then we don't have a requorum anymore. So we need to, like, regain re replication as soon as possible. If you think about any one storage server, sure, this, this storage server is storing 10 gigabytes for, you know, my database's protection group. But in fact, the physical thing, you know, the physical setup of any one of these servers is that it has a, you know, maybe a one or two or something terabyte disk on it that's storing 10 gigabyte uh, segments of 100 or more different Aurora instances. So what's, what's on this physical machine is, you know, a 10 terabyte, a terabyte or 10 terabytes or whatever of data in total. So when there's a, when one of these storage servers crashes, it's taking with it not just the 10 gigabytes from my database, but also 10 gigabytes from 100 other people's databases as well. And what has to be re-replicated is not just my 10 gigabytes, but the entire terabyte or whatever or more that's stored on this server's solid state drive. And if you think through the numbers, you know, maybe we have 10 gigabit per second network interfaces. Um, if we need to move 10 terabytes across a 10 gigabyte per second network interface from one machine to another, it's gonna take, I don't know, 1,000 seconds, 10,000 seconds, maybe 10,000 seconds. Um, and that's way too long, right? We don't wanna have to sit there and wait. You know, it, 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 we don't wanna have a strategy in which the way we re re reconstruct this is to um, find, is to have another machine that was replicating everything on it and have that machine send 10 terabytes to a replacement machine. We want to be able to reconstruct the data far faster than that. And so the actual setup they use is that if I have a particular uh, storage server, it stores many, many segments, you know, replicas of many 10 gigabyte protection groups. So maybe this protection group, maybe this segment that it's storing data for, the other, maybe for this one, the other replicas are, you know, these five other machines, right? So these are all storing uh, segments of protection group A. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones that we're also storing. So maybe, maybe this particular machine also stores um, a replica for protection group B. But the other copies of the data for B are going to be put on a disjoint set of servers, right? So now there's five servers that have the other copies of B. And so on for all of the segments that this server, that are sitting on this storage server's hard drive for, you know, many, many different Aurora instances. So that means if this machine goes down, the replacement strategy is that we pick, if we're, say we're storing 100 of these segments on it, we pick 100 different storage servers each of which is gonna pick up one new segment. That is, each of which is gonna now be participating in one more protection group. So one, one, we're gonna select one server to re-replicate on for each of these 10 gigabyte segments. So now we have you know, maybe 100 sort of um, different segment servers. And you know, they're probably storing other stuff, but they have a little bit of free disk space. And then for each of these, we pick one machine, one of the replicas that we're gonna copy the data from, one of the remaining replicas. So maybe for A, we're gonna copy from there, for B, from here. You know, if we have five other copies of C, um, we pick a different server for C. 
And so we, ha we copy A from this server to that server, and B like this, and C like this. And so now we have a um, hundred different 10 gigabyte copies going on in parallel across the network. And assuming you know, we have enough servers that these can all be disjoint and we have plenty of uh, bandwidth in the switching network that connects them, now we can copy our uh, terabyte or 10 terabytes or whatever of data in total in parallel um, with a hundred fold parallelism and the whole thing will take you know, 10 seconds or something instead of taking a thousand seconds if there were just two machines involved. Anyway, so this is, um, this is the strategy they use and it means that they can recover, you know, if a machine dies, um, they can recover in parallel from one machine's death extremely quickly. Um, if lots of machines die, it uh, doesn't work as well, but they can recover from single, they can re-replicate from single machine crashes extremely quickly. Um, all right, so a final thing that the paper mentions, if you look at figure three, you'll see that um, not only do they have this main database, but they also have replica databases. So um, for many of their customers, many of their customers see far more read-only queries than they see read-write queries. That is, if you think about a web server, if you just view a web page on some website, then chances are the web server you connect it to has to read lots and lots of stuff in order to generate all the things that are shown on the page to you. Maybe hundreds of different items have to be read out of the database or out of some database. But the number of writes for a typical web page view is usually much, much smaller. Maybe some statistics have to be updated or a little bit of history for you or something. So you might have a 100 to 1 ratio of reads to writes. Um, that is, you may typically have a large, large, large number of straight read-only um, database queries. Now, with this setup, the writes can only go through the one database server, because we really can only support one writer for this storage strategy. Um, and I think you know, one place where the rubber really hits the road there is that the log entries have to be numbered sequentially. And that's easy to do if all the writes go through a single server and extremely difficult if we have lots of different servers all sort of writing in an uncoordinated way to the same database. Um, so the writes really have to be go through one database. But we could set up, and indeed Amazon does set up a situation where we have read-only database replicas that can read from these storage servers. Um, and so the full glory of figure three is that in addition to the main uh, database server that handles the write requests, there's also um, a set of um, read-only databases. And they say they can support up to 15, so you can actually get a lot of, um, you know, if you're seeing a read-heavy workload, a lot of it can be, you know, most of it can be sort of hived off to a whole bunch of these read-only databases. And when a client sends a read request to a read-only database, what happens is the read-only database figures out, you know, what data pages it needs to serve that request and sends reads into the, directly into the storage system without bothering uh, the main read-write database. Um, so the, the read-only replica databases send page requests, read requests directly to storage servers, um, and then they'll, be ca they'll cache uh, those pages so that they can you know, respond to future read requests right out of their cache. Of course, they need to be able to update those caches. And for that reason, um, Aurora also, the main database sends a copy of its log to each of the read-only databases. And that's the uh, horizontal lines you see between the blue boxes and figure three that the main database sends all the log entries to these read-only databases, which they use to update their um, cached copies um, to reflect recent transactions in the database. And it means, it does mean that the read-only databases lag a little bit behind the main database, um, but it turns out for a lot of read-only workloads, that's okay. If you look at a web page and it's you know, 20 milliseconds out of date, that's usually not a big problem. Um, there are some complexities from this. Like one problem is that we don't want these read-only databases to see data from uncommitted transactions yet. And so in this stream of log entries, the database, uh, main database sort of denotes which transactions have committed and uh, the read-only databases are careful not to apply you know, writes from uncommitted transactions 
to their caches. They wait till the transactions commit. The other um, uh, complexity that these read-only replicas impose is that um, the, 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 these structures here, these on-disk structures, are quite complex. This might be a B tree. It might need to be rebalanced periodically, for example. And the rebalancing is quite a complex operation in which a lot of the tree has to be modified in atomically. And so the tree is incorrect while it's being rebalanced, and you're only allowed to look at it after the rebalancing is done. Um, if these read-only replicas directly read the pages out of the database, there's a risk they might see the B tree that the database that's being stored here in these data pages. They may see the B tree in the middle of a rebalancing or some other operation, and uh, the data is just totally illegal, and they might crash or just malfunction. Um, and when the paper talks about mini transactions and the VDL versus VCL distinction, what it's talking about is the machinery by which the database server can tell the storage servers, look, this complex sequence of log entries um, must only be revealed all or nothing atomically to any read-only transactions. And so that's what the mini transactions in VDL are about. And basically, the read, when a read-only database asks to see data, a data page from a storage server, the storage server is careful to either show it data from just before one of these sequence, mini transaction sequences of log entries or just after, but not in the middle. All right. Um, so that's the, all the technical stuff I have to talk about, just to kind of summarize what's interesting about the paper and what can be learned from the paper. Um, one thing to learn, uh, which is just good in general and not specific to this paper, but everybody in systems should know, is um, the basics of how uh, transaction processing databases work and the sort of impact that the uh, interaction between transaction processing databases and the storage systems, because this comes up a lot. It's like a pervasive, you know, the performance and crash recoverability uh, complexity of running a real database just comes up over and over again um, in systems design. Another thing to, to learn from this paper is um, this idea of quorums and the overlap, the technique of overlapping read and write quorums in order to always be able to see the latest data but also get fault tolerance. And of course, this comes up in Raft also. Raft has a strong kind of quorum flavor to it. Um, another interesting thought from this paper is that the database and the storage system are basically co-designed. It's kind of an integrated, there's integration across the database layer and the storage layer. Ordinarily, we design, try to design systems so that they have you know, good separation between consumers of services and the sort of infrastructure services. Like, typically, storage is very general purpose, not aimed at a particular application, just you know, because that's a pleasant design and it also means that lots of different uses can be made of the same infrastructure. But here, uh, the performance issues were so extreme, you know, they were able to get a 35 times performance improvement by sort of blurring this boundary. Um, this was a situation in which general purpose storage was actually really not advantageous and they got a big win by um, abandoning that idea. Um, and a final set of things to get out of the paper is all the um, interesting, sometimes kind of implicit information about what was valuable to um, these Amazon engineers who, you know, really know what they're doing, um, about what concerns they had about cl uh, cloud infrastructure, like um, the amount the, of worry that they put into the possibility that an entire availability zone might fail is an important tidbit. Um, the fact that transient slowness of individual storage servers was important is another thing that actually also comes up a lot. Um, and finally, the implication that the network is the main bottleneck, because after all, they were, uh, went to extreme lengths to send less data over the network, but in return, the storage servers have to do more work. And um, they put it, they're willing to have you know, six copies of the data and have six CPUs all replicating the um, execution of applying these redo log entries. Apparently, CPU is relatively uh, cheap for them, whereas the network capacity was extremely important. All right, that's all I have to say, and um, see you next week.